Hello, everybody. Welcome to this presentation about learning how to improve the diagnosis of and think about human diseases with computational models. First of all, I would like to emphasize that computational models are getting more and more involved in biomedical applications. And one of the main reasons for that is that we have now more and more data and ways to, to um, obtain various types of data and various data modalities from the human body. And there are many different ways of how one can apply those computational tools, including, for example, Alzheimer's disease diagnosis or the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and other. So I want to now present to you in a very brief manner some of the works that I, I've been involved in myself and, and uh, just to give a better overview of what, what are the possibilities here, for instance. And uh, one of the data types that I've been using is diffusion tensor imaging. And diffusion tensor imaging allows to visualize and, and to, to obtain measurements of uh, the diffusion of water molecules, which then indirectly allows to infer uh, information about fiber tracts in the human brain. And here you can see a visualization of such uh, diffusion tensor imaging um, uh, data where the different orientations indicate different or uh, are indicated by different colors. And what you can clearly see here is that this is a very complex uh, structure. And so that this is why we can use computational tools to, to analyze these and model these. And uh, what we have done in a few years ago is that we have looked into into subjects' brains uh, that have that do, do not have Alzheimer's disease, and, and and then we have also looked at subjects that have Alzheimer's disease, and we looked into networks uh, as obtained from this diffusion tensor imaging method, and then we have employed machine learning in order to create a predictive model, in order to see whether we can actually um, classify uh, a brain as having a high likelihood of having Alzheimer's disease, potentially even earlier than what is currently doable. And indeed, our method actually can be employed to different stages. So we use computer modeling in order to, to, to model what we expect to, to, occur, to occur during Alzheimer's disease progression and also how the brain changes during normal aging. And we could show that our our classifier was uh, performing uh, very well, uh, over 70% accuracy in those simulated progression um, connectivity matrices. And you can see that this, this, um, this performance was achieved uh, about five stages before, before the, the ultimate um, Alzheimer's disease was accurately reflected in the connectivity of the subjects. And, and so this also here, you can see the statistical significance as indicated by the p-value that this was below 0 0.05, uh, around um, four stages before zero, which is when we essentially modeled that Alzheimer's disease is, is uh, visible in the, in the structural connectome as measured by by this um, previously uh, obtained Alzheimer's disease connectivity matrix from the ADNI database. And so this is an indication that the, indeed computational models and machine learning can be used to, to diagnose uh, at least the risk of, of uh, subjects Alzheimer's disease being inherent in the next years. So one stage here would be approximately one year and and so there's a there, there there's an indication here that indeed there is a use for using diffusion tensor imaging data with machine learning in order to to see that there is indeed um, a change that reflects what we expect from Alzheimer's disease in terms of the structural connectivity. Um, and but of course we can also use of uh, look at other data modalities such as for example uh, at the retinal. Uh, fundus. So the retina is a, is a neural tissue at the rear of the eye. And there are different ways of how one can image the retina. 
And by looking at the retinal fundus, actually we can uh, obtain important information about the, the vasculature and, and uh, by use, looking at different uh, morphological features, we could again classify with high performance that, um, that Alzheimer's disease, and in this case actually also Parkinson's disease, was um, that the subjects had those two diseases and you can read more about this in this study here and we are actually currently also um, looking into this in more detail in order to 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 better study all the different features that might be informative here and we are also in touch with clinicians and then also we uh, have looked at EEG so this is um, um, electroencephalography in order to to look at activity of the brain and we could also there with very high performance separate different uh, dementia groups um, uh, from Alzheimer's disease, dementia with Lewy body um, disease and Parkinson's disease dementia. We could differentiate those with very high uh, specificity as well as sensitivity and also of course healthy from non-healthy. And what uh, we found is actually that the difference between eye closed and eyes open EEG activity is a very informative measure for healthy versus non-healthy subjects. And uh, again, uh, this, is, uh, this was published recently actually in, in this study. Um, um, I, I would, uh, if you're interested, I would recommend you to have a look here or get in touch with me. Uh, then we are now also looking into a different ways of modeling the brain, um, which is actually mechanistically modeling the brain. And uh, there is an advantage here because by mechanistically modeling how the brain changes, for example, during development, that we can actually better understand what is exactly going, going on. And we can then also um, make certain, certain statements about the tissue that are very um, that we can actually then compare with various other types of data, including genetic data. So here, what we did in this study here that was published uh, two years ago, we have looked into cortical development and we have created a computational model, which is agent-based. So we model each individual cell in this model and how it behaves during cortical development. And we could reproduce realistic cell numbers in different cortical layers. And why is this interesting from a biomedical point of view? We could actually also reproduce certain characteristics that we observe in polymicrogyria. So polymicrogyria is a neurodevelopmental disease where the, 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 the folding patterns uh, are altered in, in, in comparison to healthy subjects. And then we also could actually reproduce certain features in autism, in a, or at least um, in, in, in an autism spectrum disorders. And and the nice thing is that we could actually create a mechanistic model that explains those characteristics. So we, we also get a better understanding neurobiologically of what is going on in those conditions. Now, of course, these kind of models can become very computationally demanding. And so what uh, we did is a few years ago, we partnered up with uh, several institutions. And here you can see some um, uh, the, the relevant institutions uh, currently uh, where we have created the software in order to, to model such uh, phenomena like neural development using agent-based modeling in a very performing manner. And this was published um, also in, in, in uh, two years ago. And we have uh, created the software and made it available as open source. So you can uh, actually go to the website by dynamo.org and download the code via GitHub. And there is also a lot of information about how to use this software and their uh, examples. And also we are very interested in didactic, um, in didactic uh, in outreach. So we would like to, to um, help students learn about how to use this kind of agent-based approach in order to simulate their own problems, because there are a lot of different uh, topics that one can use for agent-based modeling. And so we have, for example, partnered with Intel a few years ago in, in an event 
or in a competition that attracted uh, over 17,000 students from all around the world. And uh, there is also an interview available on YouTube on this. And uh, just to give a, a, a bit of a more detailed insight into what kind of things one can model with this, apart from neural development, we also looked into cancer and still uh, work on this topic. We want to better understand how does cancer grow? How does it change over time? How does it respond to treatments? And so here you see an example where we, that was published uh, in 2020 by my previous PhD student, Jean de Montigny. And he here simulated uh, in three dimensions, um, again, using Biodynamo um, in, in a hybrid approach, actually. So we on, not only used agent-based modeling, but also a continuum approach together. And we could model realistic, uh, neuro, the, the realistic growth of, of cancers in, 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 in glioblastoma. And we could model also the various parameters and variables that are important there and that are sometimes very difficult to measure in vivo. And that's one of the advantages of, of computational modeling is also that you can really see and, and analyze in, 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 in high detail what we expect to happen. And here, for example, you can see the saturation of uh, oxygen or the density of cancer cells over time again. And uh, there are, of course, a lot of paths that one can go from here. And, and another thing that we did is we looked into treatment of, of, um, of cancer and fibrosis is one of the, one of the side effects that one has, for example, in lung cancer, if one uh, uses radiotherapy and we could actually reproduce um, previous analytical data using agent-based modeling. So we really modeled individual cells and how they respond to radiation, um, uh, radiation in, in chemotherapy and or radiotherapy. And we, we could show that we get very similar to results to what was previously established in a completely different approach. And so this can, can be now used as a basis to then also look into other aspects. How does the cancer, uh, how do cancer cells respond over time and, and, and degenerate, how can one kill different types of cancer cells most effectively and how can we adjust the dosage and, and, and other relevant topics of treatment. And so I, I would like to summarize that we have uh, different ways of different approaches to model um, such biomedical topics. We can use, for example, machine learning and, and, and uh, data-driven methods to essentially create statistical models uh, at the end of the day. And then we can also use mechanistic models, such as, except for example, with Biodynamo, where we can use agent-based models. And we can also use this to optimize treatments uh, quite well, because we have these mechanistic models that then allow to make certain predictions of what we would expect to happen if we uh, use different kinds of treatments and different treatment scenarios. And so overall, uh, this this, uh, these two approaches can, can have their advantages and disadvantages. And of course, also in the future, this means that we will have different possibilities to go from here and also different kinds of challenges, for example, regarding computational resources, but also regarding what kind of data can we benefit from. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to collaborating with uh, people who are working on this similar line of research and or if you have questions, then please do not hesitate to get in touch. Uh, this is my email address, my Twitter account. And um, I would like to thank uh, many of my uh, collaborators here. I cannot mention all of them, unfortunately. And of course, I would like also to thank my lab. Uh, over the years, we have uh, had a lot of fun and also done, uh, I think, a very nice research. And of course, I want to thank the funders that have made it possible to do this research and thank you very much for your time and attention.